Okay, welcome everyone. I uh, suggest we start. So welcome to this first keynote talk. Uh, before introducing our speaker and commentator, I'd like to mention a few uh, practical matters. Um, some of them go without saying, I guess. Uh, so please remain muted until you, it's your turn to ask a question. And if you want to ask a question, please use the raise hand function. Um, then I see that many of you have turned uh, on their videos, which I think is very nice. Uh, for those who haven't and who don't have uh, Wi-Fi problems, uh, please consider switching on your video uh, because it's, um, I think, very nice if, if many of us can see one another. Uh, obviously, if you do have uh, Wi-Fi uh, issues and you want to ask uh, a question nevertheless, please feel free uh, to use the chat function. And um, I'd like to ask everyone to keep their questions uh, short and focused. So let me now uh, welcome and introduce our first keynote speaker, Sylvia Altman. She is a professor of philosophy at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And she's also the vice president of the Sociedade Cans Brasileira. She has published widely, um, including on Descartes and Wittgenstein, but uh, the focus of her research, as you uh, know, is on Kant's uh, philosophy. She has published many articles on Kant's critique of your reason, as well as on his logic and practical philosophy. Her current research projects uh, concern Kant's account of consciousness, transcendental idealism, and empirical realism. Uh, Sylvia Altman will talk for about 40 minutes. And her talk will be followed by a response from uh, Giuseppe Motta, whom I also warmly welcome to the session. Giuseppe is a researcher at the University of Vienna or, and uh, also at the University of Graz. His publications include a monograph on Kant's postulates of empirical thought, published in 2012. And he's the co-editor of an impressive number of collections of essays, including a forthcoming volume on Kant's transcendental deduction and the theory of apperception. So if all goes well, uh, we should have about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A uh, at the end. And uh, I also wanted to remind you that after the talk, we'll leave open the Zoom meeting for um, informal conversations. So if you don't have a chance to ask your question during uh, the Q&A, don't worry, because there will be uh, more opportunities. Uh, the title of Sylvia's talk is Kant's Fourth Paralogism, Context and Structure. The floor is yours. And let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you very much for, for the introduction, the invitation, the organization of this event. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I will I will project a PowerPoint and I, I will read the text so that I try to stay in 40 minutes. Uh, are you seeing? Uh, is, is it okay? I don't think so. You're not, you're not yet sharing, okay? Oh, I'm not yet sharing. Yes, because I was sharing before and then I stopped. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, share screen. Okay, now it's working. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll then read. Rational psychology is, according to Kant, a doctrine that tries to obtain a priori knowledge of the soul from the mere representation of the self as a thinking sub, as a thinking being. This doctrine would rely on four arguments that Kant qualified as paralogisms, that is, fallacies by equivocation. In the first edition of the Critique of Pure, Pure Reason, a common structure is easily identifiable in the first three paralogisms, but not in the fourth paralogism. The second edition contains a new version for the section of the paralogisms, and although Kant says that the changes in the second edition are not of content, it is not evident to see in the new version corresponding to the fourth paralogism only a new presentation of the same fallacious argument, and especially of the criticism of it, we found in the first edition. Here, I will try to reconstruct the structure 
and purpose of the paralogisms in general and of the fourth paralogism in particular, trying to show that contrary to what it seems at first sight, the fourth paralogism in the first edition can be reconstructed so as to evidence a structure common to the first three and with a clear relation to the formulation that the fourth paralogism receives in the second edition of the first critique, of the critique. Well, I will, in the first part of this exposition, I will seek to highlight the relevance of the context of the fourth paralogism within the examination of the rational doctrine of the soul by recalling the purpose of the section and emphasizing the formulation that Kant offers in this introductory part for the topic of the fourth paralogism. In the second part, I will first attempt to reconstruct the structure common to the first three paralogisms and Kant com common diagnosis of the equivocity in them. This will be followed by an examination of the fourth paralogism of the first edition. This will follow by an examination of how the fourth paralogism of the first edition can be read as sharing a structure and be the target of the same line of criticism as the first three. So the section uh, paralogisms has to investigate the ground or groundlessness of a putative science, the rational doctrine of the soul, a doctrine that attempts to know a priori its object, the I as a thinking being. It is particularly important to see how Kant introduces this object of the attempted rational doctrine of the soul. The I think serves only to introduce all thinking as belonging to consciousness. It serves to distinguish two kinds of objects through the nature of our power of representation. I, as a thinking being, am an object of inner sense and am called soul. That which is an object of outer sense is called body. Soul is a name for the transcendental object of inner sense, a name for that, let's say, focus, that X to which we relate as determinations, the objects of inner sense. So the distinction is made through the nature of our power of representation. Soul is the name of the focus to which we relate the manifold of representations of inner sense, and body is the name of the focus to which we relate the manifold of representations of outer sense. And this distinction is made possible because the representation, I think, so to say, brands serves to introduce all thinking as belonging to consciousness. It is inner and related to a Nix we call soul, that which has a certain relation to the I think, as opposed to that which is related to what we call bodies. Now, although the soul, although soul, the term soul, is the name for the object of the determinations of inner sense, the intent of rational psychology is to know this object not as an object of inner sense, but exclusively through its relation to the representation, I think. And from that, we have the sole text of rational psychology. At the ground of this doctrine, we can place nothing but the simple and in content for itself wholly empty representation, I. Through this I, or he, or it, the thing which thinks, Nothing further is represented than a transcendental subject of thoughts equal it, which is recognized only through thoughts that are only through the thoughts that are its predicates. If what makes us call something an object of inner sense is its, ob is it, is its relation to the I thing, then we necessarily have the representation of an X to which all that can be accompanied by the I thing is related. So we have the following. Given the role, given this role fulfilled by the representation of the X subject of thoughts, this X is necessarily represented in certain ways, is represented through the predicates of the I think taken problematically. The intent of rational psychology is then to project these predicates, which constitute necessary predicates of the I think thought problematically, take these predicates and project them onto the X transcendental object in the concept of which we unify the determinations of inner sense, project that into what we call soul. Now, that projection seems perfectly legitimate. After all, it seems obvious that in order to relate an object of inner sense as a determination to an X, 
This X has to be a thinking being and have the four the properties I necessarily represent in any X thought problematically as a subject of thoughts. So it seems, but it is the ground of groundlessness of this move that consists transcendental philosophy has to investigate. Very quickly, before moving on to the considerate reconstruction of that investigation, it is worth, for reasons that will become clear later, briefly highlighting how the topic of the fourth paralogism is presented by Kant already on the first edition. The fourth topic to be subject to investigation is the soul is in relation to possible, Kant's emphasis, possible objects in space. This relation to objects in space, in turn, gives us the interaction with body, which in turn allows us to represent the soul as the ground of animality. This animality then, when limited to spirituality, gives us the concept of immortality. So I would like to keep in mind that the topic of the fourth paralogism, already in the first edition, is the relation between soul and bodies. It tries to demonstrate that because the soul is in relation to merely possible bodies, the soul could be independent of them and therefore immortal. With this in mind, let us now consider how Kant presents and criticizes initially the first three paralogisms. It is easy to recognize a common structure of the first three paralogisms. Let us consider the first that the representation of which is the absolute subject of our judgments and hence cannot be used as the determination of another thing is substance. I, as a thinking being, am the absolute subject of all my possible judgments and this representation of myself cannot be used as the predicate of any other thing. This I, as a thinking being, soul, am substance. Here we have something like the, the following, and I'll simplify, every absolute subject, is substance. I, as a thinking being, am represented as absolute subject. Therefore, I, as a thinking being or a soul, am a substance. That is, would have something, something like that. Every absolute subject is substance. I, as a thinking being or soul, am an absolute subject. Therefore, I, as a thinking being or soul, am substance. In the case of the second paralogism, we would we will have as the major. That thing whose action can never be regarded as the concurrence of many things is simple. And then the following corresponds. And the major on the third paralogism is what is conscious of the numerical identity of itself in different times is a person. So we can easily see a common, a common structure. On the major premise, every, every absolute subject or thing whose action cannot be seen as a concurrence of many things, or on the third, being conscious of its numerical identity is substance, symbol, or person. And in the minor, we always have I as a thinking being or soul, M, condition of the major, and then in the conclusion, I as a thinking being or soul, M, predicate of the major. Let us now see what is the equivocal term that renders these paralogisms paralogisms? A remark in the B version of the paralogisms, which for reasons we could discuss, I think could be applied well here, explains why the equivocity is, as it should be, on the middle term. The general structure there of the paralogisms is presented slightly different, but I think in an equi evidently equivalent way. Uh, for the first one at least, for the first three ones at least, we have the following. What cannot be thought otherwise than as a subject does not exist otherwise than as a subject, is therefore substance. Now I, as a thinking being, considered merely as such, cannot be thought otherwise than as subject. Therefore, I, as a thinking being, also exist only as such a thing that is as a substance. And Kant says that the ambiguity, the equivocity, is in the expression cannot be thought otherwise. He says the major premise talks about a being that can be thought of in every respect, and consequently, even as it might be given intuition. 
The minor premise talks about this being only insofar as it is considered as subject, relative only to thinking and the unity of consciousness, but not at the same time in relation to the intuition through it, it is given as an object for thinking. So, uh, so in, the, in the first, we have what cannot be thought in every respect, and in the second, relative only to thinking and the unity of consciousness. And Kant also says that the major premise concerns an object in general, whereas the minor talks not about things, but about thinking. With that in mind, let us examine the scheme, let us examine again the scheme of the first three paralogisms. We can see that in order to make the inference, we have to take as unconditioned what in the minor premise is attributed under a certain condition, a thinking being considered merely as such. However, according to Kant, we have no grounds for simply attributing the predicate cannot be thought otherwise than as a subject to the I absolutely. This attribution is in the minor premise conditioned to the thought of a thinking being exclusively in its role of allowing me to think of myself as the subject of all my judgments. But the major premise requires in order to authorize the attribution of the predicate substance to something, that this something could not be thought of otherwise than as a subject, absolutely, not made considered in a certain way. Kant's effort in the criticism of each of the paralogisms is to show that it is false that we necessarily must think of the ultimate substrate of thoughts as under the condition of the minor premises. As an example, consider a quote from the second paralogism. The proposition, a thought can only be the effect of the absolute unity of a thinking being, cannot be treated as analytic. For the unity of a thought consisting of many representations is collective. And as far as mere concepts are concerned, it can be related to the collective unity of the substance cooperating in it, as the movements of a body is, com is the composite movement of all its parts. Drawing on the analogy with the movement of a body, consider a play or a dance. There are properties that can, not, that can only be attributed to the play or the dance as a unity, properties that cannot be predicated of the actors and dancers. But that does not mean that the play or the dance are ultimate substrates. In the same way, the necessary simplicity of the representation of the I in order for it to be represented as subject of thoughts does not allow us to conclude for the simplicity of the substrate of thoughts. That would mean moving from properties of thinking to properties of a thinking thing. Still in terms of the Second paralogism, the simplicity of the representation of the, of the representation of the subject is not therefore a cognition of the simplicity of the subject itself. In terms of the force paralogism, we have something uh, uh, equivalent. Kant says that the problem is that the rationalist passes off the constant logical subject of thinking as the cognition of a real subject of inherence and thus that it signifies a substance only in idea, but not in reality. We can recognize here what Kant says is the mark of every illusion, taking a subjective condition of thinking for the cognition of an object. And the ground of the illusion is that the minor premise makes a merely transcendental use of certain concepts Whereas the minor and the conclusion, an empirical use, and Kant exemplifies it this way. Excuse me, not a trans. Yeah. Thus, for example, the concept of substance in the paralogism of simplicity is a pure intellectual concept, which, in the absence of conditions of sensible intuition, is merely of transcendental use, that is, of no use at all. In the minor premise, the very same concept is applied to the object of all inner experience yet without previously establishing it in concreto and grounding the conditions of its application. And hence here an empirical, although unreliable use is being made of it. 
Let us see how this applies, for example, to the second paralogism. The major premise says correctly that that thing whose action can never be regarded as the concurrence of many things is simple. The minor premises now subsumes a particular case, the empirical object of inner experience under the condition of the major without first adequately determining the conditions for such subsuming and whether they are satisfied, relying exclusively on the way we necessarily represent the act of thinking. Doing that, the paralogism takes as real what is only in the idea, takes as objective what is only a subjective condition. So we would have like the following always. We have in the major, that which cannot be thought otherwise than three dots is slash I as a thinking being considered merely as such am the condition of the major, I as a thinking being exists as the predicate of the major. And we have as a diagnosis that cannot be thought otherwise than as can be meant absolutely in the major or in the minor considering a thinking being merely as such. And another way to put the same problem in the major considering the cognitions for the cognition of an object and in the minor considering only subjective conditions. And at the basis of this confusion is not examining the conditions to empirically use a predicate, the predicate of the minor, of the, of the major, I'm sorry, or not examining what warrants that something empirical can be subsumed under the condition of the major. So we would have that for the three paralogisms. Uh, now let us look at the fourth. At first sight, the fourth paralogism has a completely different structure not even mentioning the term soul or I as a thinking being. We have in the first edition that whose existence can be inferred only as a cause of given perceptions has only a doubtful existence. All outer appearances are of this kind. The existence cannot be immediately perceived, but can be inferred only as the cause of given perceptions. Thus, the existence of all objects of outer sense is doubtful. Now I propose to represent the structure of this argument as follows. Uh, uh, every inferred existence has doubtful existence. In the minor, everything outer has inferred existence. Therefore, everything outer has doubtful existence. Now we should further note that to a merely inferred existence Kant opposes what is immediately perceived. And second, the opposite of doubtful existence is obviously indubitable in existence. And the opposite of outer is obviously inner. And now let us put in place another crucial assumption of rational psychology. The identification between being immediately perceived and the determinations of the I as a thinking being. If we accept those equivalences, then by substitution and conversions, which I'm not going to do here, we can say that the paralogism presented by Kant is logically equivalent to the following syllogism. This is the second part of the, of the, the quote, of the, of the uh, slide. The only indubitable is existence is of that what is immediately perceived. In the minor, the, determin the determinations of the I as a thinking being are the only things immediately perceived. And C, conclusion, the only indubitable existence is I, the thinking being and its determination. Well, now we see the connection with the topic of the fourth paralogism, which I highlighted at the beginning, the statement from which we could derive the soul's independence from bodies in space. And we can also, and we have also arrived at a syllogism with the same structure as that of the first three paralogisms. What cannot be thought otherwise than as indubitable, indubitable independently of other things has independent existence. I, as a thinking being, consider merely as such, have independent indubitable existence. 
I, as a thinking being, can exist independently. And we can also see that the former diagnosis about the problem with the syllogism applies. We have that cannot be thought otherwise than as indubitable independently of other things can be meant absolutely or considering a being merely as such. And another way to put it, considering the condition for cognition of an object in the major and considering merely subjective conditions in the minor. If the existence of something is indubitable absolutely independently of the certainty of something else, then this existence is independent. But the minor is true only in sense two, considered under the condition of being thought exclusively in its role as subject of thoughts, everything the existence of which we can be certain is what is inner. However, it does not follow from this that the minor is true in the sense of the major, that is, absolutely. Likewise, considering conditions for the cognition of an object, the major is true. But a minor is true only considering merely subjective conditions under which alone I can be represented as the subject of all my thoughts. So we have the same basis for the confusion. <coughs> so, so we have the same diagnosis of equivocity. And again, the basis for the mistake is the same as in the other paralogisms, trying to apply to an object, a concept based exclusively on its, trans, on its intellectual meaning. The problem is how to make a concrete use of the concept exists independently. How can we determine that an object, the soul or the subject of the determinations of inner sense, is under the condition of the major, cannot be thought otherwise than as it dubitable independently of other things? The rationalist ignores that difficulty and applies the predicate based simply on how we act, how the act of thinking is conceived and concludes for the independence of the thinking being as regard that, as regard what is external to it, outer bodies, in a move strictly parallel to that of the other paralogisms. And we have exactly the same structure, given the conversions and substitutions I made. Finally, we can also see that the reformulation of the second edition of the fourth paralogism differs from the previous version only in mode of presentation. We have in the B edition, the formulation in the B edition is that I distinguish my own existence, that uh, of a thinking being from other things outside me to which my body also belongs. This is equally an analytic proposition for other things are those that I think of as distinguished from me. But I do not thereby know at all whether this consciousness of myself would even be possible without things outside me through which the representations are given to me. And thus, whether I could exist merely as a thinking being without being a human being, without contact to outer objects. Or it is not hard to explain why Kant formulated it so differently in the first version. We can explain it because the ultimate basis for the attempted paralogistic move was an alleged difference in the degree of certainty of the existence of the object of inner and outer sense. Therefore, it is adequate to denounce the fallacy of this syllogism, this, in this proposed reconstruction I made, by the syllogism can present it in the first analogy. That is, every inferred existence is doubtful existence, every outer object is inferred existence, every outer object is doubtful existence. That is on the basis, that would be on the basis of the move made in the reconstruction I proposed. So it would be appropriate for Kant to do that. Although appropriate, perhaps Kant's choice of formulation for the fourth paralogism in the first edition has led to misinterpretations. What do, what do we learn from seeing the equivalence of the equivocation in the syllogism with the earlier paralogisms? Seeing, I mean, just suggested here because a lot of exegetical work would have 
to do, be done to, I didn't even mention here the difference between transcendental and empirical senses of outer and inner that would have to be done, but for limits of purpose, I restricted myself to here. But if we can accept those equivalences, what, what do we gain? If we keep in mind the purpose of Kant's criticism of the paralogisms in general, we can see that all he wants is to refuse the move from subjective conditions to an alleged condition, cognition. He has to block the attribution of merely inferred existence to outer objects based on the necessary distinction I trace between myself and that from which I distinguish myself. But that is simply removing one of the bases for refuting the possibility of certainty about external objects, about outer objects. It is not a proof of that certainty. If that is so, perhaps it is not appropriate to see the critique of the fourth paralogism as an attempted proof of the existence of external objects, a proof which in the second edition was to be replaced by the refutation of idealism. And this has, I think, several advantages, which well, we can go to them in the discussion. What we would have then, I believe, uh, well, I'm no, sorry, no, I would end here. <laughs> I think this would have several, I think there are several problems. I don't know how, I'm on, how I am on time, because I'm uh, not- Yes, uh, so you have like eight, eight more minutes if you, if you want. Okay, well, I, I would just, so I'll just mention some, some, some advantages, I think, of not reading uh, the, the, the answer to the fourth, uh, to the, fourth uh, the criticism of the fourth paralogism as an attempt to prove the, the existence of um, in spite appearances. That's why I said a lot of exegetical work has to be done with the text. But in spite appearances, it would have a lot of advantages not reading it. Uh, first of all, we would explain, all of them can be explained otherwise, but but taken together, I think they make a strong case. First, we would explain why Kant says that the refutation of idealism in the second edition is the only strict proof of the existence of outer objects. Second difficulty, Kant says here that he will deal only with problematic idealism and he will be concerned with dogmatic idealism later. Well, if he had proved here the existence of outer, if he, he thought he had proved here the existence of outer objects, by removing the possible doubts that the problematic idealist admits, why would he have to then deal with the dogmatic idealism? He has already proved that, that they exist, so, so the outer objects exist, therefore they're possible. Uh, second, in order to be a proof of the existence of anything, uh, the point of departure would could not be the I think taken problematically, but assertorically involving I can infer the existence of other things from my existence, but then I'm not considering that I think merely problematically. So it would be something contradictory in the fourth paralogism as to what he said he would do. And um, we would explain Kant's surprise with, with interpretations like the Fede Garvey review. He, was, he seemed genuinely surprised that they took him as uh, reducing in any sense objects to representations, although he says uh, that. So he must have said that in a different way than meant to prove the existence of other objects because they are representations. So I'll leave it at that and for the discussion. And thank you very much for your attention. I will, I guess I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, for your very interesting uh, talk. Uh, so um, I now hand over to Giuseppe Motta for his comments. Yes, uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Karin. <clears throat> well, uh, I, let me begin like that. I, I, I have spent uh, a part of my life in Marburg and Erlan, and there I assisted at Rainer Brandt's attempt to define the numerical shape or figure one, two, three, slash four as a sort of uh, organiza organizational principle of European cultural history in general. An uh, Ordnungsprinzip der Europäischen Kulturgeschichte. You will uh, you all probably know about that. I must confess I did not and I don't like so much that idea or that 
cultural project, if you prefer. But on the other side, I think we shall admit that this shape, that shape is really extremely important in analyzing specific parts of Kant's system. And no doubt, Rana Brandt is right when he says Kant uses this shape constantly, but never addresses or discusses it as such. And well, as I read uh, Kant's four paralogies in the context and structure by Celia Altman for the conference here in Louvre, I was uh, uh, some ways surprised in two different senses. Huh? From on the one side, I was really touched by the logical sophistication and elegance in reporting uh, and describing the general idea of the whole structure of the paralogism. And Atmalt paper is, I think, really precious in this sense. Kant's fundamental idea to make use of an equivocal term at the same time transcendental, the I think, and the ontological meaning of the substance in order to dismiss rational uh, psychology in general is here illustrated in a very impressive and very useful and very convincing way, I think. On the other side, I was some way surprised from that try to partially dismiss that shape of one, two, three, slash four, if you want. Altman tries to reconnect Kant's four par argument to the arguments develop developed in the first three syllogism or paralogies. In that way, she tries to fundamentally reduce the qualitative difference between one, two, and three on the one side and four on the other. Her argument is really brilliant, no question. It bases, as uh, you have seen and heard, on a sort of paraphrase or transformation of the three sentences in the paralogism. Let me read uh, the paralogism uh, once more again in, in German. Kant writes, uh, dasjenige und dessen Dasein nur als eine Ursache zu gegebene Wahrnehmungen geschlossen werden kann, hat eine nur zweifelhafte Existenz. Nun sind alle äußeren Erscheinungen von der Art, dass ihr Dasein nicht unmittelbar wahrgenommen, sondern auf sie als die Ursache gegebene Wahrnehmungen allein geschlossen werden kann. Also ist das Dasein alle Gegenstände äußerer Sinne äh, zweifelhaft. Ja, yeah, I will not uh, repeat the, the very brilliant uh, transformation or paraphrase of uh, Sylvia Altman. I really appreciated it. If my function as a respondent is not just to ask questions, but also to develop a sort of personal reflection on this topic, then I will say that uh, I really prefer to confirm the very specificity of the four paralogies in its particular position. That means uh, its real context and contextualization is not only and cannot only, in my opinion, be constituted by the other three paralogisms. On the contrary, its real context is and must be searched in the other fourth moments, the moments number four in the critic of pure reason. That means basically in the broad context of the categories of modality and of the postulates of empirical thought in general in the transcendental analytic, but even outside the critic of pure reason. Let me resume in very, very few words the contents, uh, the contents of uh, the postulates. As Karin said, I've written about that. The first and the third postulate of possibility and necessity have a strict nosological or even epistemological meaning. They belong to the Kantian, in German, Erkenntnis theory. The first postulate, I quote, whatever agrees with the former condition of experience in accordance with intuition and concept is possible. That means in order to know something, I need forms, space and time in categories, of course. The third postulate uh, is that was connection with the actual is determined in accordance with general condition of experience is exist necessarily. That means once again, in order to be known, everything must be subsumed under such forms. But I think it's very important to say that the second postulate has not a nosological, but a very fundamental ontological meaning. The second postulate is that which is connected with the material condition of experience of sensation is actual. 
That means before starting knowing something at all, I must assume the real existence of things outside of me. There can be absolutely no doubt about the existence of things in themselves. And Kant develops, of course, here the famous refutation of idealism. So I assume the fourth paralogism is just a sort of translation. And in this point, we are with, I don't agree perhaps with Sylvia, or repetition of this very fundamental assumption. Let me paraphrase or repeat or transform the fourth paralogism in this different sense. So the major is if I think the thing, the thing in itself, the thing in this, just a cause, is a cause or presupposition of the phenomenon, Erscheinung, you know, then the thing in itself is just possible. The minor, I am confronted as a subject with just with phenomena, with the Erscheinung, conclusion, then we have to assume thinking themselves, Ding and sich, just as possible. And this argument is false. It must be false. Thinking themselves are for Kant not just hypotheses. They are, on the contrary, the very basis, the very basic principle for the world critical project. I can try to say it with the words of uh, Alois Riel. Das Ding an sich ist seine Grenze des Denkens, nicht in Bezug auf die Vorstellung seiner Existenz, then that cannot be in question, the existence of thinker outside of me. It's, it must be sure, eh? sondern nur in Bezug auf die Beschaffenheit uh, der Dinge. In other words, Ding an sich, the Ding an sich, the thing in itself, is real and cannot be assumed as just a possibility. They are in their reality at the very, very basis of the whole critical project, which is finally a neurological project as uh, uh, demonstrated in postulate number one and number three. I just think in this sense, this, this ontological assumption of postulate number two and of uh, paralogism number four is finally more important in Kant's system than the whole paralogistic argumentation, uh, even, and can, of course, not or not completely be resolved in it. And this is perhaps the, the point I uh, want to stress in my, in my response. Yes. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Giuseppe, for your uh, comments and reflections. Uh, Sylvia, would you like to uh, respond uh, briefly? Yes, I'll respond briefly, mainly because I'll keep things in mind and try to think about them further. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your comments. Uh, well, um, well, I'll, I'll just stress things that I will keep in mind and try to work further, given what you uh, what you said, uh, especially the connection with the uh, well, given that the fourth paralogism, uh, the fourth uh, group of categories, the fourth title of categories, which are the modalities. And I think it's a very, uh, well, I have to put it on paper and work it out, but I think it's a very interesting point to connect uh, to connect that. And I think that is, that is necessarily involved when we try to do something which I did not hear, which is to explain uh, what that, all that talk about two senses of inner and two senses of outer and transcendental and empirical are doing that. There, uh, I think when we reconstruct that, we would have to use the the, um, the postulates and uh, and I'll, mainly the postulates. But we end up using the analogies too, because you know because the, the second postulate is what is connected with the material is uh, is actual. So I think uh, I, uh, I, for now I would just take that as a homework <laughs> to make that that connection. I think it's a very important point and, and I would just say that that would go into all the exegetical work about these parts about two senses of inner and outer which are completely out of the second edition and then adequate to reconstruct as I did. I'm, I'm not so sure and this is perhaps I didn't understand uh, very well, if perhaps if you could repeat, that you think that the important thing in the fourth paralogism is uh, blocking the possible doubt about the existence of uh, the thing in itself. Did I understand you right? 
Yes, that yes, yes. That, that I would not be so sure. It seems an interesting, uh, and I would say, why not? Again, I would have to look closer at the text. Because if you look at the text of the second parallelism, he seems all the time to be talking about objects in space. And, uh, and well, obviously, thing in itself, it's not in space. So uh, again, I just I'm not refusing that attempt, but I, I would, that one I would have to, to again look closer at the text, trying to see that, because he he seems clearly all the time he insists, oh, it is enough that well, oh, that's another. By the way, that's another advantage of not trying to see this as a proof of the existence of whatever, either thing in itself or outer objects. He seems to assume that at least some the material of our thought is of our imagination is given by the object of outer thoughts. If we read that, it seems like a petitio principi. But anyway, that's just a first, a first reaction. I, I, I see some difficulty in reading that way, the, the fourth paralogism, given that it seems so, it seems at first phase to be talk, at, at, at first sight to be talking about objects in space. But uh, again, uh, the suggestion is very interesting and then, Yes, I, I, I think I just want to thank you because it's a really, very, very important point. I, I quoted a real, a Royce real, and the real is uh, indeed convinced that things in space are being transition. And this is a, a particular interpretation, which uh, is a very uh, particular interpretation, a mm -hmm. very strange interpretation. At the Finally, a right interpretation, in my opinion, but uh, it, uh, uh, yeah, it needs a, a sort of big explication. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you, um, the two of you, for uh, your contributions so far. So the floor is now open for uh, questions. So if you have a question, please use the raise hand function. Uh, Gunther Seller, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you to both of you. Mm, I see here, looking at the text, that the alternative to idealism in the A version of the fourth paralogism is not realism, but dualism. And I wonder what that means for the uh, relation of the paralogism here in the A version to the alternative refutation of idealism in the B version. So the uh, position to support by rejecting the paralogism is the co-equal status of inner and outer uh, perception experience also, as opposed to the subordination of inner experience under outer experience in the refutation of idealism in the second edition version. And putting that together now with uh, the reference that you also gave us, Sylvia, to the Garvey review. This is a move on Kant's part to downplay the extent of idealism and to introduce an element of realism that we would characterize as empirical realism rather than transcendental realism in uh, the B version of the uh, refutation of idealism. We might now still have to look into the simplified and streamlined version of the paralogisms in the B edition, because the fourth paralogism doesn't disappear. It's no longer separately presented, but it's still supposed to be included under the generic formulation that uh, comes up in place of the three separately listed and critiqued paralogisms of the A edition. So it's a very complicated play between um, responding to the Garvey edition, simplifying and streamlining uh, the paralogisms, and inserting 
the refutation of idealism into the analytic rather than the dialectic. I wonder how you see the relation of your uh, reconstruction to those, let's call them strategic issues of interpreting and uh, assessing uh, the paralogisms. Okay, uh, th thank you. And, and it's nice to see you again. Good. <laughs> and thank you for the question. <laughs> Uh, just uh, I'll give a provisional uh, answer because this is this is what what I have what I plan to work from now on is going on to the B edition interpretation of idealism. So I'll just give a provisional story of how I tend to read all of this, and I, and you tell me whether that answer at least in part your question. First, uh, one other th about dualism uh, as an as the alternative to, to idealism. Uh, that again would depend on working on the details of the criticism in the first edition. I think Kant's point is would be the following, it would be to say that, well, well, well I think this, this, is, this, is, this is not what I think. I think this is pretty clear. From an empirical point of view, there's a dualism, there's a, the objects of inner sense and outer sense, but from a transcendental point of view, neither materialism nor pneumatism, or I don't remember exactly the word. I mean, from, from the transcendental sense, we cannot say of the thing itself, a thing in itself, whether it is material, whether there are two kinds, three or four, we cannot say anything. So I think his point there uh, is that, but there's a sense in which um, another difficult matter, which connects with the relation between outer and inner sense is that uh, there is a sense in which he recognizes the truth of the major, of the, of the minor. There is a kind of um, certainty about object of inner sense. A in a certain sense, there is an immediacy difference from outer. Be and in another sense, because we cannot be sure simply by having a representation of an outer object that it exists, that we cannot. But in another sense, there is an equal uh, amount of certainty because, and this is what I think, but it would have to be proved. I think that Kant in the first edition is simply assuming as obvious that objects of inner sense take the material ultimately from objects of outer sense. I think in the first edition, he never posed, him, he, he, and if you read the text, it's, he, he seems to be taking for granted. He says, oh, it is enough that imagination depends on some representation of outer objects, but he doesn't argue for that, he uses that. So I, I have the impression that in the first edition, it never occurred to him to doubt the existence, neither of objects of outer sense, objects in space, nor of the thing in itself. I think it, 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 it was assuming both things, that we do not create what we think about and that, our, that, and that we depend ultimately on objects of outer sense as the material. I think he was taking that for granted. And that's why I think he was so surprised with the Feder Garber review. And, and then he gives a short answer in the prolegomena where he makes it explicit. And perhaps that, well, that's, that's why I said it's provisional and very speculative. And then, well, now I have to address this question. Uh, I, I, I have to address this question, which is now being challenged. I'm being misinterpreted. And he realizes that part of what led to the misinterpretation was having what was meant in the criticism of the four paralogism to simply take out of the way one sort of objection against the certainty of object of outer sense had been taken as a proof of, the, of that. And so he said, okay, I'll make a formulation that leaves clear that I'm not talking about that. But now he has to address this issue, which he didn't address before, which he tries to do in the refutation of idealism and then continues working with that. It seems never happy with, with what he found. So that, that would be the what I would say is a provisional reading, but that would depend on better analyzing then the, the prolegomena and the refutation of idealism and what goes on afterwards. So I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, so right now there are no, um, no hands. So please, uh, Lorenzo, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your talk, which was, really clear and I, I, I really I, it was really fascinating 
so if I have understood it correctly, you stress a lot the in you push forward what could be called a continuist interpretation, which takes the, the two versions of the paralogies to be strongly similar, to be pretty much about the same thing. However, like in the in the second edition, Kant talks of the existence of the, the existence of the subject as independent from other objects. And it seems to me that in the first edition is the opposite. He talks about the existence of the object independently from the subject. And I was wondering what you think the logic is behind this, this change. For instance, I, I've always thought that, I don't know, that can somehow change it in his mind. He kept something of the four of the A edition version of the four paralogies and just severed it from something else, which he put then in the in the reputation of idling. But I was wondering how you were reading this kind of change in perspective from the independence of the subject from object. Oh, sorry, the contrary of the independence of the objects from the subject and vice versa in the second edition. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, let me, I'll see if I, I'll, answer, I'll say something and if I haven't understood you, correct me. But I, I would say this, um, it depends on what you understand by having as subject, the existence of the subject as independent and the existence of the object as independent. If the topic is properly the independent existence, then to prove the independence of the existence of one is to prove the independent existence of the other. Uh, so in, in that sense, they, they would be related. Uh, they, they are not, if you say that one depends on the other and the other depends on one, then, then, then you would have to have two way. Uh, so I would say this, I think if, I think that although it might seem that Kant is trying to say that objects of outer sense exist because they are not indep completely independent of me. They are in a, in a transcendental sense. Although he seems to be saying that, I think that reading poses the problems I, me I, I mentioned. I think it is very hard to see. So I think what I'm suggesting is that already in the first edition, the object, the topic was the independence of the mind, the independence of the, uh, of the thinking thing. Uh, but uh, and, uh, but I, I understand that uh, when you read the text, it seems obvious that that is what he's saying, that he's saying, no, 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 listen, objects are not completely independent from me, therefore I can be certain of their existence equally. But, um, as I said, it, it would that would take a longer thing to do to distinguish the senses in which they are the minor is true and in, in which it is false. But uh, well, I know I'm not just repeating my point. <laughs> I'm just repeating my part of insisting that although it may seem that uh, he's there asserting the dependence of object of outer sense in one sense in relation to the thinking being. I think that poses more problems than solutions. And I just propose another way to read it and see in the fourth paralogism, always the topic about the independence of the subject. But well, I, don't, I know just repeating what I said, but uh, I couldn't say more now. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so are there further questions? Well, maybe you need uh, another second to, to think about one. Uh, I've got uh, a question myself, Sylvia. And I think it's related to the preceding one about the notion of objects, uh, because um, I think that that maybe the two maybe we need to distinguish between two meanings of the term object. And I think that if we use the term object of outer sense, we already imply that the object is precisely not independent of mm -hmm. um, of cognitive activity. Yes, because mm -hmm. it, it's the it, we take something to be the object of outer sense mm -hmm. 
yes, whereas we also want to be able to talk about objects in the sense of things that cause an impression um, in me, yes, or on the human mind. And um, so I'm, I'm not completely sure, you know, to what extent this is relevant, but I, I was listening to the, to the preceding discussion and I, I had this question, yes, yeah, so I was talking about uh, the object in the sense of a thing that that exists independently of your mind, or are we thinking, or are we talking about an object of um, perception, of sense, of thoughts, of cognition, and so on? Uh, because I think it's in the latter sense that, according to Kant, it's the human mind that precisely um, produces the objects. So. Um, so that, that is one question that maybe you want to answer. And I have a, a similar one uh, that I, maybe I can, I can then ask uh, later on. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I don't know if what I will say is correct or helpful, but uh, I would tend to think that uh, Kant, there's a sense in which he would identify object of outer sense and things that cause an impression. That is, from a transcendental point of view, uh, the object of outer sense is a thing that causes that, 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 that the, it is the matter of our thought. It is, uh, and um, it is, independent, this object, it is independent of us, object of outer sense, that which causes in us an impression. It is independent of us only as to is its existence. As to its existence, we don't produce it. And that's why we can, you're right to say that, well, if it is an object of outer sense, it is an object already for us. It is a phenomenon, it's not a thing in itself. Yes. Uh, but I think Kant would still say that that is something that is independent of me as to its existence, because we don't produce its existence. Uh, so I think he's talking, he is he's talking all the time about that, not about the thing in itself. It's another thing, the relation that this phenomena has to thing in itself. It's the way it appears. Well, that's another point. But I, I would say that, that it is the object of outer sense. So it is an object for me, it is a phenomenon, but it is a thing that causes an impression and it's independent as to its existence, not not to form, not to and, and well, not not even to its identity. It's not. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, um, it it does. Although I I myself I tend to um, make the distinction distinction stronger. Yes, to to say that so if something is treated as an object of outer sense, then we treat it precisely as a phenomenon. And as something that is at least partly constituted by your mind, and and precisely not as that which causes the impression in the first place. Yeah, so it could be the same object ultimately, but but I think that the two perspectives are very different, and that um, I, I I personally find it more helpful to uh, to to think of them as 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 very different, even though they ultimately might refer to the same uh, to the same uh, object, just like like this pen. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. I think perhaps I answered you quickly. It, it, it depends on what. Uh, perhaps what I was trying to emphasize was this uh, letter, less less sentence of your. Even if perhaps they refer to the same thing, but I think there are contexts in which it is very important to to make it clear how are you considering this thing which is the same. Uh, yeah. I just think that, that that he. My point was just to say that I'm not sure that here. Kant is talking about his word about proving the existence of things in themselves, and uh, but but I think you're right. I would agree. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so so unless there are other questions from the audience, uh, I would have an um, another one uh, concerning the the notion of subject. Uh, so we now move to the other side, um, and I think it's it's very intriguing that Kant used this expression, the transcendental subject. Uh, of thought, yes, so using it in a kind of quasi-logical or quasi-grammatical sense. And, um, and of course, we tend to think of, of uh, the subject as the ego or the I or whatever. 
um, whereas I think that the that's the the the, the expression the subject of thoughts emphasizes more uh, this this more formal aspect that there has to be you know a simple x that is the subject of something else and uh, I, and and so i'm wondering whether this sense of subject then be to be the subject of something in this case of thoughts uh, whether you think that Kant also um, presupposes this more formal notion of subject, even when he doesn't use the expression subject of thoughts? Yes, like like in other parts of the critique of pure reason or the or the transcendental dialectic. Well, good question. I should think it should be used in the transcendental deduction in a way it has to be there but uh, but uh, it would have to you would have to be very careful uh, but that would depend on analyzing something else which i want to do which is the connection between uh, several uses of the i think we have the i think taken problematically here which is uh, simply now, now it is an X subject of thoughts. It is whatever an X, and, and we just think of it the predicates that are necessarily linked to something as a predicate, uh, as a subject of thoughts. Then we have the X subject of thoughts as the object of inner sense. What is the connection? They cannot. It cannot be simply that they, they are two different things. The 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 uh, the subject of thoughts and the object of inner sense cannot be two different things. They must be just be the same thing. The point is that we cannot project what we think in an X subject of thoughts to this X. Then there is uh, the I think which involves the con mere consciousness of my existence, which is so. Well, I'm not answering. I know, <laughs> but uh, I think that this. I think that we would have to use this. Although he doesn't speak of it, we would have to render this talk about transcendental subject or thoughts compatible with the role of the I think in the transcendental adduction, at least. Exactly how to do that, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think it should be compatible uh, with, uh, with what he says uh, about uh, the function of the I think and the B deduction. Mm -hmm. but, uh, not a homework for me to do. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, further questions? Uh, Lorenzo, please. Yeah, so I have a small question. Uh, so before in answering Professor Zoller's question, uh, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that you said something like in the, before the B edition, Kant never doubted the existence of other, of other things. And if I understood you correctly, and in, in the A in the A edition, I think. Yeah. Wait, so could you? So, no, no, I, I, I was not sure what I heard you write in the in the A edition. He yeah, I think that in the first in the first edition, it seems to me that he took for granted that. But but as I said, it was a professional answer. But I'm sorry. Go on. Okay, no, yo, yeah, thank you, because I always thought, I've always read Kant, not as if he himself doubted the existence of other things, but as answering a famous philosophical problem, a famous philosophical puzzle about the existence of other things. And so I was wondering whether you think that, because I mean, Kant already, already talks about this puzzle in the already in the Nova Divulgatio or in the dissertation or in the dissertation. And so I was wondering how you why you think he himself came to doubt this instead of just taking it as another philosophical puzzle as he seemed to do in the before, where for instance if you take the dreams of a spirit seeker, he just makes fun of people who have this doubt. So how do you think he came to see these as a serious philosophical problem? 
because I've always taken this to be on the opposite something you always treat treated simply as a as a puzzle. So this is just more a curiosity. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Again, again, again I'll give you a provisional answer. <laughs> I would say I don't think Kant ever uh, came to doubt. I think he did. He wasn't worried about precisely because he didn't take it seriously. <laughs> he wasn't in the first edition. He was not worried about uh, answering that. He was not concerned about uh, addressing that um, that difficulty. Uh, he was, what I mean is in his exposition, he's taking for granted that, his, that he's assuming, he's accepting as given that uh, outer, that, uh, that let, let us put it this way, that is that the thinking being is not the only thing, that, that, that thought is not the only existing thing. And then he is challenged, I, th I think, I don't think he comes to doubt but I think he realizes there's something he has to prove. Uh, and that's why it's a scandal that it has not been proven before. And then he inserts the refutation of idealism. It's not that he came to doubt, I think, simply that he realized, well, I have to prove something here. Uh, and um, it's another question, what exactly he wanted uh, to prove? Uh, and, and this is a very, again, something very tentative, but I tend to think that what he realized he had to prove was not the existence of something that is not thought, that is not the existence of, a, um, of the thing in itself. I don't, I, I don't think he was concerned about that. It seems to me he was always concerned about proving the dependence of inner sense from outer sense. So I would say that the, the two connected things, one thing is to say that outer, that inner representations depend on outer representations. It's a connected but different question and how the connection is done is something else to prove that, um, that not everything is phenomena, that there are things in itself. I think Kant is always concerned with the first question. And this question about the dependence of inner sense on outer sense, it's not made explicit in the, in the first critique. Even the fact that the matter of inner sense is ultimately the object of outer sense is only made explicit in the second edition. But I think this is only the making explicit of something he was assuming all the time. And that, so the need was not that he came to doubt the existence, he came to realize he had to offer a proof of that. And, um, and so that's why he, the evidence for that would be inserting the refutation of idealism, uh, which in my interpretation was not there, had not an equivalent in the first edition, especially not in the fourth paralogism. But the fact that he inserted that, he realized that, oh, there's something here I have to prove. And, and then he keep, keeps coming back to it in notes and texts and everything. So exactly why then I don't know. So the hypothesis I presented was, okay, he was, this was something he was assuming and he was challenged about that assumption and he tried to prove it. So, so that's why, but not that he came to doubt it. Yes, but he yes. yeah. I personally think he should never have, you know, bothered about it, but that's my uh, personal opinion. <laughs> Okay, there is a further question, uh, Thierry, please. Thank you, just a small-ish point. Um, I think like many others, I was hugely impressed with all your substitutions, uh, but the final one, the crucial one where you substitute in um, the IS thinking thing, um, I can't exactly remember what, how exactly you got it in. Um, I, I, I can perhaps project it again with that. Well, if you want to, yeah, that might help. But um, my question is simply, why should we accept that substitution? You might have said something that I missed. Um, it just didn't seem as straightforward as the others to me. So The last um, one, you mean? Yeah, the final one, yeah. which for your yeah. purpose, obviously, is vital. So I was just wondering whether you might um, be able yeah. to say uh, something yes. more about it. Yeah. Uh, no, we have. Oh, where is it? No. Let, just let me. No, let me, just let me find where is the, oh, here. There we have it, yeah. 
Uh, yes, yes. I only, I only, <laughs> I only mentioned that you, you can see that I placed it separated from the others <laughs> because I know this is a problem. This is this is not this is not evident at all. Uh, I just said in the when I read the paper, I solved this simply by saying that we had to introduce this as an assumption that the rationalist uh, psychologist makes. Uh, and I, th I think I think I think there, it's another point why we have to accept it. That's a difficult question, but here I just mentioned well the rationalist psychologist uh, does assumes that so he, he works with that. I think that well well that's not the most interesting question. That's how I solved it here, <laughs> just to put it. Uh, and I did that because although I think this is a very polemical point, but I think there is a sense one sense in what Kant admits that. But that's a very hard thing to argue for. It, it would take another paper. Uh, if you, if, if, why, why am I saying that? First, I'm saying that because if you read the beginning of the criticism of the fourth paralogism, Kant clearly concedes that. He evidently, con he says that. So, there, so the trick lies in saying, well, there is one sense in which being immediately perceived is only the determination of what I as a thinking being. And there's another sense in which object of outer space are also immediately perceived, but not in the same sense in which, uh, so, uh, so, why, uh, so that, but that would have to be, but that, that would be the, the central idea. But then we would have to take the postulates and the analogies and, and everything to show that there's an asymmetry while at the same time, there is an immediacy of outer objects too. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Sylvia, yes. So I think we should uh, conclude the formal part here. So uh, once again, uh, th thank you Sylvia for a great talk. And thank you, discussion. thank you very much. Uh, and thank you Giuseppe for your uh, comments. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for contributing to the uh, discussion. Uh, so I guess that some of you uh, will have to leave.